Hello and to QVision, your local newsroom which covers the stories and features from Kingston and beyond. On today's show, we invest the support for sufferers of motor neuron disease. Are there guests they need? Making their own destiny, young entrepreneurs of today. Anyone for duck's tongue or chicken feet? Oh, that's disgusting. What is that? The not so common Chinese cuisine. Motor neuron disease affects approximately 7 in every 100,000 people worldwide. In the UK, an average of 6,000 people are expected to be living with the disease at any one time. The severity of the disease means that the majority of sufferers will die within two years of diagnosis. Clem Johnson went out for. So, what hope is there for sufferers of motor neuron disease? Well, here at the Institute of Psychiatry at King's College London, we talked to Professor Al Shlabi to find out more. Motor disease is a condition in which it becomes progressively paralyzed. So usually they'll develop weakness either in a hand or a leg or perhaps in the tongue. And that first symptom will result in something like a dropped foot, which means they'll trip up, or to opening door handles or jar or slurred speech. So the actual problem on a cellular level is that the motor neurons themselves degenerate. So what it means is the cells in the brain that go in the motor cortex, and it has a long wire that travels through the spinal cord, the wire is called an axon, and that to another motor neuron that lives in the spinal cord and sends its axon out to the muscle. If the motor neuron living in the brain is affected, if that degenerates, then the person develops stiffness. If the lower motor neuron is affected, that's the neuron from the spinal cord, muscle, then the muscle wastes away, the muscles flicker, and the hand becomes floppy and weak. Once the disease reaches the diaphragm, the sufferer experiences difficulty breathing and eventually dies. On average, the number of people living with motor neuron disease at any one time is approximately 7 in every 100,000. The majority of sufferers are between ages of 50 and 70, with men being affected twice as often as women. People within this age group often have young or dependent families. We spoke to Gaston Brown, sufferer of motor neuron disease, to find out what impact his recent diagnosis has had on his life. My name is Gaston Brown, I'm a MNDS sufferer. Um, before I took ill, I never heard of MND before. But now I'm ill, I just have to come to terms with my illness and accept it and live. There's a lot of things I try to do for myself especially addressing myself very slowly. And when I com complete that, it gave me a great satisfaction. The care I get from my families are not carers, but they are doing their best. And uh, at the moment, I'm going care of. I can get out of the house and do my little walk, and I share a laugh with my friends. And um, I sp although I spend most of the time in lying down in the bedroom, it's just a one way of relaxing, you know, just... I'm not a heavy drinker, but occasionally I drink Guinness. <laughs> and I also take my vitamins, and um, I'm looking forward for life. With his family's support, Aston is well, but some people aren't as lucky. We spoke with Lee Garnett of the MND team to determine what a person living with MND can get. A lot of equipment is provided by the government, but our biggest problem is the time it takes. It may take six to eight months to get a proper wheelchair for somebody, but the lifespan of that person could only be 15 months, so they're spending half of the rest of their life um, trying to get a piece of equipment. And because the deterioration is constant, the chair that they've requested eight months ago may not be the wheelchair that they need when they get it, which is a huge problem. Um, I think the best thing about technology with science world is that they all talk. It's not so much about science wanting to keep their research to themselves, so they are the ones that find the cure. Scientists are meeting, they talk on Facebook and they, they share their research, and so I think that a cure is coming. Uh, it mightn't be in our lifetime. I think it's definitely coming. I think with the research updates that we've been getting, it's all positive, and I think they're excited. They're excited that day I'll be made redundant. That's what I'd like. <laughs> with the ongoing research, it is still very difficult to find out whether you are leaving school or university. So, prospects for our graduates, and would they be better off trying to start out on their own? Gabriel Okewu has been finding out more. The latest data from the University Application Service, UCAS, says 25,000 more students went to university than last year, a rise of almost 6%.
For many young people, university is the best way forward for them to succeed in their chosen career. Developing skills and technique can only learn with formal education. I think in university or through university there's a lot you need to learn about art and special fine art because it's a lot of developing your own practice and knowing where you where your interests lie and what you want to do. I think university is really key to gaining that. A lot of sort of understanding that if um, that when you come out of university a degree doesn't really usually get you very far. It, it of life skills that get you further that degree. My degree probably contributed five percent towards my success right now. And I know many other individuals who, who went along the route. They went to university, but they, they did not use their degree. Some of them didn't even get the opportunity to use their degree. I think in a, in a day and age where we live in today, there's so many more opportunities rather than depending on university as the only stepping stone to sort of getting a good career for yourself. If you wanted to be a doctor, you would need to ask university because these things you will not learn by yourself alone. If it's more in the creative industry, like someone like me, I use me for example, um, the music industry courses in the country are actually quite to, to a certain standard and I thought to myself, why not I use my initiative and life skills? So it really depends on what direction you actually take with yourself to be. So university is a good path. The university is definitely a place where you can get professional training and then participate in different competitions, whether they are in the field of business or sports. But it's definitely in the only to become successful. There are some people who are successful by starting their own business without going to universities. The whole change of fees, of uni, uni fees, so from going from 3,000 to 9,000 had a huge influence on my decision. I just didn't feel that it was worth paying £27,000 for doing that. For a degree that I could have basically gained the knowledge from just working. You're to Bemi, when she told you that she didn't want to go to university and become an entrepreneur, what was your, your first reaction towards it? To be honest with you, I personally, maybe because I didn't go to university and I've done so many hands-on courses, I did not object to it completely. But I done was furious about it. Initially, my parents, that I wasn't going to go to university, they thought I was joking just because the majority of people go to uni, my friends were going to uni, my sisters went to uni, they didn't really understand where I was getting that idea from. Um, explain to them the steps I wanted to take, so focus on doing my business, work on um, getting collections made, in the future go on to do my masters. They then saw eye to eye with me on why it is that I wanted to do what I was doing. So you've heard what people had to say about whether university is the best way forward for them to succeed in their future career. Back to you guys in the studio. So, is going to university worthwhile? We end in the studio by Dr. Martha Madour, Head of Enders Entertainment at Kingston University. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, is, it, is it still worthwhile for students to get a question from university? Oh, absolutely. Uh, there's lots of evidence around that uh, people with graduates earn more money over their lifetime, lifetime than people who haven't gone to university. So actually people who go to university are very privileged in that way. So it is worthwhile on that score. But several of your commentators in that package said uh, uh, we're kind of talking about enriching their experience and building their life skills and using initiative. All of those things are part and part of a university degree. They're not separate things and they're not opposed to a university. So I think, and I, I think university is a great place to acquire that initiative and to use your initiative. There's so much going on around the university that you can do, that you can get engaged with and uh, it all adds your, um, your uh, skills and your capabilities and what you're going to do later on in your life. Uh, you talked a little bit about uh, what universities can do, but um, what, what can they do to develop students' entrepreneurial skills? Well, there's a lot going on here at Kingston. I mean, I, I did a survey last year which uh, of students, when they were just registering uh, to start at the university, and only two and a half thousand of them said that they wanted to do this one day. And so the university is very keen to help those students meet that aspiration, to meet those aspirations, and to develop their capability to do that. So uh, there are things that students can do from, from the student perspective. So there's a very active student entrepreneur society, Kingston Entrepreneurs, which they can get involved in. And I run, <coughs> excuse me, I run a whole series of programs uh, outside of the curriculum, 
which uh, bring in speakers, bring in entrepreneurs to the university, brings together a network of entrepreneurs from across all the different disciplines in the university. Uh, I run business competitions and ideas competitions. I run boot camps, hackathons, all sorts of different things uh, so that students can build their understanding of enterprise and build their portfolio of enterprise. Um, last year, Kingston uh, produced more graduate entrepreneurs than any other university in the UK. And I think that's partly because of all the things that are available here at Kingston and, uh, and all the things that are available both in courses and outside of their courses here at the university. Dr. Martha Madour, thank you very much for uh, joining us. It's a pleasure. While many people are too busy taking care of themselves, there are still those who make it their life's work to look after others. Reverend Anina Goretti has made it her mission to help those in her community and abroad. So many orphans out there who don't have anybody that need help. I am an orphan. My auntie looked after me, paid my school fees. Because looking at myself, if I did not have anybody who pick interest in me, I would not have been who I am today. What my auntie taught me, it has caused me to have a heart to help other people. You may be born in a slum, but necessarily it doesn't mean that the slum is your destination. You need somebody to come your way to be able to help and see that child fulfill that destiny. In our community now, um, I am working on a project, Global Children um, Music. You know, so personally, I would like to do my best what I can do to see how I can reach, to empower these children, to let them also have identity, to know who they are, to know also someone with a heart for them, to tell them and to know they are important. That is basically what it is we are doing. Everyone wants a relaxing trip abroad, but for international students, just how easy is it for them to study while integrating into their local society? We discovered the facilities available for all our international visitors. The United Kingdom has throughout the years increased the enrollment of students offshore. We've seen an average annual growth rate of 6.4% in international students. King University, home to over 23,000 students, has increased its number of international students to over 4,000. We took a look at how these students are welcomed at Unison University through the members of Connect U International Society, a society whose aim is to bring both UK and UK students into a welcoming environment. I think university is quite big and it's important for you to join societies and different clubs to meet new people. Yeah, I have a society I really like, the UK Connect, and uh, I found very nice people there and they were very welcoming, so my first year was very easy. The UK Connect Society in Kingston were very welcoming to me as an international student and the same to my friends to international students. So. Freshers is a really great way of letting people know who we are from the very get-go. Um, and then from there we have flyers we hand out. We have a Facebook group called Connect UK International Society. Um, but I really wanted to get involved just to make international students feel welcome at Kingston, make sure that their time here, they can look back and remember it's a good time. We have a lunch every Wednesday, it ranges 30 to 80 people depending on the time of year and what's going on. We also have Starbucks quiz nights every Thursday, um, which is a fun time just to, you actually learn a lot more and then you just have fun. We've definitely big grown and parties gotten a lot better and yeah, we've just kind of getting bigger and growing each year. So do you think this society will continue for an extended time? Yeah, I really hope after I leave. <laughs> international student enrolments continue to increase each year and we shall continue to see its growth in an international society at universities throughout the UK. One thing for certain, Kingston University is continuing to provide a warm and friendly environment for these offshore students and we can keep this encouraging welcome society for Now. Most students spend all of their time sitting in their rooms. I, uh, I know I do. Of course, and I'm always studying in the library. However, some music students are taking their studying into the streets of Kingston. I think how you can do it yourself 
and just kind of how you can approach it differently. Like, don't try to emulate anybody apart from yourself. Just be yourself and let see if people like you, man. Do you know what I'm saying? I am Lynette Kemper and I'm 22 years old and I study technology at Kingston University. I'm Kyle Freeman and I'm 22 and I study just straight music at Kingston University. We play music uh, for most. I sing and a bit of keys and pads and do some electronic stuff on the computer. I'm a freelance musician, been self-employed for the last years and I play guitar. We play all different kinds of genres. We do um, covers for uh, some small gigs, just stick ones, um, and then we play our original stuff with a whole band. We have a game, this explodable landmine filled invisible obstacle course, yeah, that we call the entertainment industry, yeah, with no definitive answer of if we're going to make it or not. Like, I am so confident in my skills and own, but like we're saying, it isn't what you know, it's you know. Hi, my name is Ricky C and I'm a 20 year old rapper from Leicester. And I was always interested in hip-hop from about, I'd say about the age of eight, nine, and then I heard a lot of like old school records. And... As a rapper, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just being real in it, like, a lot of things are coming from like this kind of old school method, you know what I'm saying, of like, oh, it should just be guitar and a drummer and a bassist, you know what I'm saying, like, when somebody like me comes along and kind of like glitches the matrix, for example, you know what I'm saying, I think they just, I don't know, they don't really know how to do it. The London community is really different from up north. Obviously, like people are more to themselves a lot here, and it does take time. But I think as an MC, our kind of version of busking is CD. So, do you know what I'm saying? As well as busking an MC, we kind of do it a bit differently because we can do it in like kind of a clan of MCs, if you get what I'm saying, to kind of get like that circle. You know, everyone comes around, and a way to kind of promote ourselves and do it. But yeah, I definitely think it's kind of like an untouched kind of thing that a lot of rappers are doing. Ricky, let them yeah. wild go on. Wild hold tight, man, man, like you said, and then behind the curtain where he knows that most of these facets are... Well, we perform in loads of different places in Kingston, um, and I think we're kind of kind of known to the local uh, circuits to run music. We'll share a shelter Of my single bed We'll share the same room Yeah we just provide the bread. Is this love? Is this love? Is this love? Is this love that I'm feeling? Is this love? Is this love? Is this love? Is this love that I'm feeling? I get to know, got to know, to know now. Kingston is one of two boroughs, including Camden, where busking is free. Anyone can do it. All you have to do is be respectful of noise levels and not offend shops. So if you're being just repeating the same set over and over again, a shop can ask you to move on. Whereas in other places, you might have to pay a permit fee or something, which could vary so much. So if it's Covent Garden, you probably pay a couple of quid anyway to have a busking license. Yeah, Covent, uh, you have to do auditions for yeah. to be playing there. So it's quite really hard. It's only the top people kind of get in there. To be honest with you, as long as I'm happy, like, I hope, obviously, the IAU will have taken off and I'll be able to be putting that through and helping the UK and helping everybody else and the rest of the world through that way, do you know what I'm saying? Because, like, bringing music and hip-hop and everything else to the world, really, like, the ability to do what you guys are doing now, do what I'm doing now, do you know what I'm saying, to everybody, rather than it being to the person that gets signed to MTV or stuff like that. While Chinese food is enjoyed by everyone, not everyone enjoys Chinese food. We all know the traditional Chinese takeaway menu of chop suey and sweet and sour pork, but have you ever tried chicken feet or duck tongue? Chinese food is very popular in the UK. There are many Chinese dishes that British people really love. However, 
There are dishes such as duck tongue and chicken feet that most British people have different opinions on. What part of the duck are they? The tongue. Oh, the tongue. <laughs> Very nice. Never had duck tongue before. Oh no, I'm not going to eat with the duck tongue. <laughs> Oh no! Oh, that's disgusting. What is that? It's like duck tongue. Oh, chicken feet. I can't. I can't eat them. It looks disgusting. Uh, I don't think I can try them. They don't look very nice. <laughs> Hwarang I can give you some information about the, the general nutritional content of, um, of those types of foods as well. It's not something that you would find normally in the UK. Um, uh, for example, for, for chicken feet, then you probably have something like about 60 calories per one food. So about 50 grams is one food and that, way, that gives you about 60 calories. So if you ate two, well, close to 100 grams, you get about 100, 120 kilocalories. Um, with um, duck tongue, you get um, about um, 50 kilocalories as well per 100 grams. I think one tongue probably weighs about 9 grams, so they're quite small. So if you ate 10 of those, you get about um, 100 kilocalories uh, for that one. Um, in terms of um, pork skin as well, you, it tends to be quite high in fat. Um, so you get quite a lot of fat in, in pork skin. Um, so that would be a, perhaps a less healthy option. Um, but there's, there's not, nothing really wrong about eating those. It's not something that perhaps in the West we would feel perhaps so much ease of, of trying. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that they're superfoods or they're really healthy, but um, I can't see any problem in, in eating them. There's a lot of choice there. So vegetables, try to use the chopsticks, don't add any extra sauce. Uh, try to add more vegetables and, and ask for less um, uh, meat. Try to go for the boiled or, or perhaps um, stir-fried as opposed to the deep-fried or bad options. And be careful with the um, uh, starters that you choose. Yeah, it's like dim sum and chicken. Good? They try it a bit. Yummy? Yeah, so mommy try. We are now joined in the studio with our very own food specialist, Ansa Bakir. Can you give us examples of other unusual foods from around the world? Well, food in itself has brought people together by the table and have made societies flourish. So if you would look at strange food or f foods that very particularly here in, in the UK. You can see, for instance, in some parts of America you eat bull testicles, or in Sweden you have rotten fish, in Norway you eat um, uh, goat head, and so on and so forth. Um, why do people choose to eat these? Well, mostly, f if you go back in history and into the cultural traditions of these foods, you always see that there are two main reasons. One of them are nutritious value in these foods, containing high in, in, in uh, proteins, hormones, uh, vitamins and minerals. In other parts, uh, you would see that factor would be a more cultural or even a religious factor. Do you think that foods like this are adopted in England? Absolutely. I mean, you, you can go to Tesco's and buy a chicken masala, and, and this is one of the most beautiful things of, of the multicultural society, where we have people coming from around the world and bringing their traditions and cuisines with them. Well, thank you, Anne Bakir, and that's all. That's all we have time for in this prom. We'll be back next week, same time, as we explore behind the masks of the stormtroopers. Join us then. Goodbye. Stormtroopers.